I'm Joyce Tischler. I'm pleased to be moderating and presenting on this important panel titled, titled Challenges and Opportunities Lawyers Face Today in Advocating for Farmed Animals. Before we get started, I want to give a special thank you to our platinum sponsors, the Brooks Institute for Animal Research, Law and Policy, and the Carroll House Furniture. This session is going to explore, oh, farmed animals, things that we are doing, opportunities that we have. Joining me today are two esteemed presenters, Leah Garces and Piper Hoffman. And after our presentations are concluded, we'll be taking questions from participants. And if you have questions, go up to the microphones that are there and there, and we'll also be taking questions from people online. For those joining us virtually, you can submit questions via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Now I'd like to introduce my co-panelists. Leah Garces is the president of Mercy for Animals and the author of Grilled, Turning Adversaries into Allies to Change the Chicken Industry. She has nearly 20 years of leadership experience in the animal protection movement, and she has partnered with some of the world's largest food companies on her mission to build a better food system. Leah oversaw international campaigns in 14 countries at the World Society for the Protection of Animals, and she launched Compassion in World Farming in the U.S., her work has been featured in national and international media outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, BuzzFeed, Vice, and the Chicago Tribune. Piper Hoffman, who's over there, brings more than 20 years of legal experience to bear as the Senior Director of Legal Advocacy at National Farmed Advocacy Group Animal Outlook, and she serves as an adjunct professor at um, at New York Law, I'm sorry, New York University, or NYU Law School, and teaches animal law. She earned her JD cum laude from Harvard Law School, where she led the ultimately successful campaign for the school to begin teaching animal law. I'd like to invite Leah up to the podium to begin. Is this on? Great, thanks Joyce. Um, I'm so glad to be here today. My name is Leah Garces, as you just heard, uh, and I am the CEO and president of Mercy for Animals. Mercy for Animals is 23 years old and we are an international animal protection organization for those of you who don't know. We have uh, offices in Mexico, Brazil, the US, Canada, India, Singapore, uh, soon hopefully Singapore and Hong Kong at the moment. Um, we're always looking to pivot and have the most impact for animals. And our mission is to end, end industrial animal agriculture and to construct a just and sustainable food system. Uh, and we are approaching 200 team members globally. And we couldn't be more excited uh, about being here and making an impact for animals with you all. A little bit about me, if you don't know. Um, so I have been working in inter international animal protection for over 20 years, and I'm gonna give you the number three. I have um, three passports. I have a British passport, a Colombian passport, and an American passport, US passport. Uh, and I have three children, Ruben, Asher, and Andrea. I have three companion animals. Um, I have a cat and two ferrets. I have one spouse, not three. <clears throat> um, so on to the subject of the day. <clears throat> so there are 80 billion land farmed animals that are raised and slaughtered every year in the world, every single year. And that number is going up. And according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, in order to meet the demand for human consumption by 2050, that number, the number of animals is set to double. So human beings are rising out of poverty and malnourishment is going down and then our numbers are going up. So well done human beings, very bad effects for, for farmed animals. And so our work could not be more urgent. And this is why we are here. It's why we wake up every day and do the work we do. 
Um, and speaking to a fine group of lawyers, this is our little org chart internally, I want to really paint a big picture for you about who we are at Mercy for Animals and why lawyers are so important. We have, sorry for the team members that your names are on here in the room, but there you go. Um, we have 12 team members in our organization, and they're all under the brilliant uh, Jody Medoff, who's sitting right over there in the orange, um, who is our general counsel. And we have legal directors in Mexico and Brazil and two interns. We have regular internships, so please apply, please look. They're both year round and there are limited time periods for summer, for example. Uh, and we really engage with other counsel as well. So we do pro bono, what we call low bono. Um, we also pay people sometimes too, when we have to. And they're all very, very important. Needless to say, we rely a lot on lawyers to do our work. And our legal team is here to defend, to protect and advocate for the interests of farmed animals and to protect mercy for animals and do things like compliance um, operations. And they do proactive litigation, enforcement and rulemaking efforts. So they are very impactful and very important and you all are very important. So I wanna to try to paint that picture over and over again to you today. I wanna to talk a little bit about the challenges we face uh, and I'm gonna name three challenges. There's many more, many, many, many more but I wanna focus on three today. Uh, so the first one that I want to speak about is Prop 12. Anybody heard of Prop 12? Anybody heard of the Supreme Court? Yeah, okay. So most of you will know and be aware that uh, the state of California, it passed Proposition 12 in 2018. And it was this super amazing, clear mandate from the people saying we cannot and we will not allow animals to be kept in close confinement like this. It's unacceptable. And the ballot measure was passed in 2018. It was this clear mandate, 7.5 million Californians passed it. Many of you in this room were probably out there uh, collecting signatures, being part of that campaign. And we all celebrated when that happened. But you know that very recently, the pork industry started to fight that to the extent, very aggressively to the extent that it's been brought up to the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court. And on October 11th, uh, oral hearings happened. Um, did anybody listen to them or, okay, who listened to them? Let's see who's in the room. All right. Yeah, um, anybody read the transcripts? Yeah. Um, very few cases make it to the Supreme Court. So when this happened, when we knew that it was gonna be taken up, it was really scary. It was a very, uh, it was a defining moment for our movement in many ways. Uh, and the oral arguments were the National Pork Producers versus Ross. Um, and the oral arguments lasted uh, over two hours. I think they were set for one hour. Uh, and it was a fascinating, fa fascinating uh, moment. Uh, if, if you haven't spent time, I know you all read so much, you're really good readers, I know. Um, but if you haven't yet, read the 157 page um, transcript, I really do recommend, it's actually like reading a John Grisham novel to me. Um, it's really great to read and it highlights this moment because the arguments are not just about the legality. Actually, when you really look between the lines, they're also arguing about the morality of this. And that is the first time that has ever happened in the history of the Supreme Court where farmed animal morality is being, the discussion around how we're treating farmed animals in our food system is being discussed. And it was a really, no matter what happens next, that alone is a very significant moment that we are in that we couldn't have been in 10 years ago. And we'll know the outcome in the next one to six months or so, and it will change how we have to work. Whatever happens, it will change our government affairs work and we will have to pivot, we will have to change, we'll be challenged by the results of whichever they are. Um, and so Mercy for Animals actually recognize this opportunity, um, not just as a moment to, uh, to change the Supreme Court's mind or influence the Supreme Court if they can be influenced, but to rally public awareness. And so we actually conducted an undercover investigation, which is something we're known for. We've conducted a hundred undercover investigations in our time, and we try to do them very strategically. So we, we did this one to be timed for the Supreme Court's oral hearings, oral arguments, and this was really showing what's at stake. We did an undercover investigation showing uh, mother pigs trapped in crates and the brutality of it, the cruelty of it. Um, I know you just ate, I'm not gonna show you extensive footage on this because it is very disturbing, uh, but we wanted to really drill into the minds of those making these decisions 
who is who is suffering and what is at stake with this decision. Um, regardless of what the outcomes are of the Supreme Court, Mercy for Animals is going to keep fighting for animals, for farmed animals, and continue, uh, whether it be through the Farm Bill, through rallying public awareness um, and building power through the public on this during this moment, we will continue to do that. And we all need to do that when we're challenged in this way by um, by court rulings, we have to keep going. And things are rarely won the first time. And so we have to keep going. Uh, so the second point that I wanted to talk about, the second challenge that we have is around um, corporate engagement. So corporate pressure is something Mercy for Animals, putting pressure on corporations is a really big part of our work. We believe in institutional change. You're seeing um, in our work, we're always thinking about the highest impact for animals, and that might be in the animals uh, reducing the suffering of animals or sparing their lives completely. So getting people to go plant-based or, and we think that the most effective way is through institutions. So institutional change. So that could be Supreme Court, government affairs, but the other side of that coin is government, is corporations. So we do a lot of corporate pressure campaigns. Um, and what that could look like um, is that, um, we first sit down with companies to educate or negotiate with them, and we try to impact them in some way and have them move towards cage-free policies, crate-free policies, or improving the lives of broilers, chickens, for example. And sometimes that doesn't work. And so sometimes we have to do uh, campaigns and they're pressure campaigns and they're usually negative campaigns. Um, and these negative campaigns have risks for us. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that does. But I, I also wanna highlight how important this work is because through this work, we have made some of the most monumental achievements to date and mostly around getting rid of cages for laying hens. So. Over 2,000 company policies globally have been passed now where companies are moving away from cages for laying hens. And this goes globally. So that can be anything from, uh, and it always has a timeline. So it could be 2022, 20, 2025. In some cases, it's too long, 2030, and we're working on enforcement. But this is a really clear mandate that this is working, that putting pressure on companies results in real change, real impact, real reduction of suffering for farmed animals. And so we think it's a really, really important and viable method. <clears throat> now, as I said, at times we're running these campaigns and the companies don't like it. And we launch these campaigns and one of the main legal risks that we suffer, that we have to mitigate against, that we have to look out for um, is defamation risk. And we have to work dil diligently and carefully with the legal team to navigate um, defamation cases, uh, defamation risk and legal risks around that. Um, outside of the United States, so that's in the United States, defamation is our biggest risk. But outside of the United States, we have other risks that um, we have to navigate. And this could, in Brazil, for example, we're facing several lawsuits right now from companies that where we've launched these cage-free campaigns um, and they're suing us not only for moral damages, but they're also claiming that we infringe on their trademark rights by using their logos, their names in our campaigns. So our legal teams have to spend a huge amount of time sort of navigating these risks and thinking about um, how can we still put pressure on companies to elicit these changes in their policy when they're not listening to us otherwise? So we have to be really creative about this. We don't want to spend our time in the courtroom if we ha don't have to. It's expensive. It takes a long time. Um, and we avoid it if we can. So the third one that I want to quickly go through is undercover investigations, which I've touched on a little tiny bit. Um, as I said, we've done 100 in our history, 50 drone investigations. And just to take you through a real example of why this is important, um, we did recently, we hadn't had any progress for broilers in three years, and then we did an undercover investigation exposing how Costco treats chickens in their supply chain, and this resulted in a New York Times piece that then resulted after an eight-month campaign bringing Costco back to the table and them changing their policy, impacting 100 million chickens per year. That's how important work like this is. The power of undercover investigations can't be underestimated if we can get media coverage on it. 
but it's becoming harder and harder. And if you don't know about ag gag laws, if you haven't, have people heard of ag gag laws? I'm sure many of you have, right? So this is a real threat to the kind of work we do. It continues to be a threat. Um, and if you don't know what it is, it, they were introduced in response to undercover investigations. And they seek to gag whistleblowers to punish those documenting the cruelties rather than punishing those um, doing the cruelty. And this is where we are really challenged and it very much limits where and how we can do our work. Um, 25 states have attempted to do ag gag uh, laws so far in the United States uh, since 2011. Um, and many of these have been challenged in court. Uh, if in several of these challenges, courts have found that laws are unconstitutional um, in violation of the First Amendment, but currently five states still have ag gag laws in effect, and those are Alabama, Arkansas, Missouri, Montana, and North Dakota. And North Carolina had an ag gag law um, that was ruled unconstitutional, but it is currently an appeal, so it's still pending. And uh, most recently, if you hadn't heard, Iowa's ag gag law was held to be unconstitutional. Yay! Um, really great work to the team working on that. Um, although there are still some provisions that will make our work hard. And this is just to emphasize, this makes our work harder. It really limits where we can shine a light on this darkness because factory farming is in every single one of these states. And in fact, the states that have ag gag laws are the ones that need the light shown more. So it really challenged us in our work. So to end on a high note though, not on all the, the terrible and challenging things we have to navigate around um, is transformation. So this is where we are really trying to think of solutions to some of these challenges. Uh, how can we navigate around some of these challenges? And transformation, if you have, has anybody heard of our project called Transformation? Yay, good, okay. Um, transformation at a glance, it looks at um, working with factory farmers. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but that is what we're doing. And we are trying to work with factory farmers to get them out of animal agriculture and into alternative means of income, everything from hemp to mushrooms to um, any kind of specialty crop. We even have a farmer who is turning their old factory farm into a dog rescue clinic, which is, I know, right? <laughs> it's very sweet. Um, it's, it's a whole business approach. It's a holistic approach. Uh, and I will say though, that one of the most interesting things is a lot of the, what, if you've read my book grilled, you know, that big surprise for me is finding out that factory farmers don't want to be in this business any more than we want them to be in the business. And this was an opportunity to help them transition. And we're finding real allegiances and allies and new storytelling that can happen through these partnerships. So much so that we ended up again in the New York Times um, in an op doc in February, where we were able to expose the realities of chicken farming, not just from the animal's perspective, but also from the farmer's perspective. And on Super Bowl Sunday, it was the most emailed piece out of the New York Times. And that's how popular this storytelling is. So we're navigating around this and finding ways forward out of these challenges. As a movement, uh, we continue to make incredible progress for farmed animals because of each of you in this room. And I thank you, I encourage you to keep going. Um, I've described a few of the challenges that we face that are relevant to a legal mindset. We have many more, of course, that we face. And I really look forward to hearing your questions, your reactions, um, your challenges you're facing and your ideas for overcoming them. Thank you very much. Try not to give your talk. <laughs> Ooh, hi. I'm Joyce Tischler, and I teach industrial animal agriculture law at Lewis and Clark Law School. The majority of people still do not know that this is how chickens, pigs, turkeys, and other species are raised for food. These animals are kept in massive buildings such as this, and the EPA calls this concentrated animal feeding operations, concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. 
I want to show you a chart I made up, and I think we can all agree that I do not have a career ahead of me in graphic detail. But it gets the point across. It summarizes the harms that CAFOs cause, and it also provides a visual, at least for me, of the opportunities that we have to challenge this system. The CAFO system crowds animals into confined spaces, ignores most of their most basic needs, but it also harms the environment. It harms, it's a major contributor to climate change. It harms the communities where these CAFOs are situated. It harms the people who work in these places, it harms food safety, public health, consumers. In fact, it harms just about everybody, but Purdue, Tyson, Smithfield, and the massive corporations that conduct this industry. CAFOs produce waste. What goes in must come out. CAFO waste includes nitrogen, phosphorus, E. coli, growth hormones, antibiotics, chemicals used to clean the equipment, uh, copper sulfate that's used to uh, clean the feet of cows, animal blood, silage, leachate from corn feed. It contains a bunch of stuff that really ought not to go into the environment. And of course, it's not treated to reduce disease-causing pathogens, heavy metals, pharmaceuticals, or any of what's in it. In fact, if we go back to this, it's piped into ditches that the industry calls, oops, let's go back one more, those Pepto-Bismol pink ditches are called lagoons, okay? The industry calls them lagoons. And this is where all of that sludge and waste and chemicals and manure and, and, and urine comes to from the CAFO buildings. But there's way too much of this in there. And then it's taken and it's sprayed on fields nearby. But there's way too much going onto the fields, more than the fields can handle. It pollutes groundwater. It leaches out. It goes into nearby streams and rivers. Over 168 gases are emitted from CAFO waste. And the most typical of those gases are ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, methane, and all of these pose health risks, not only to the animals in the CAFO, but to the human beings who live nearby. Let me go back now that you've seen the lagoon. Oops, sorry. Oh, I just, I turned it off. Liberty, okay. <laughs> okay, there we go. Exposure to hydrogen sulfide can cause neurological problems, extreme anger, depression, and illness. And the CAFO system causes a variety of serious problems. But as I said earlier, here's the opportunity. We can attack from all of the angles that I showed you. I'll give you an example. The cow palace. Cow palace is a dairy. It's a CAFO in Washington state, and it exploits 11,000 cows at a time. This lawsuit was not about the poor treatment of the cows. It was about how the cow palace annually produces and dumps 100 million gallons of untreated manure, which is hazardous waste. The plaintiffs were an environmental group and they claimed that the cow palace was violating the Federal Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RICRA. That's an environmental law intended to ensure the safe treatment, storage and disposal of hazardous waste. So that it does so that it minimizes threat to human health and the environment. And these plaintiffs were able to prove that the lagoons at the cow palace were leaking manure that was contaminated with high levels of nitrate. And high levels of nitrate in underground drinking water can lead to various types of cancer, increased mortality from strokes and, from, and heart disease. The court in this case granted partial summary judgment to the plaintiffs holding that the defendants had in fact violated RICRA, and after that the case settled. And the Cow Palace had to spend very large amounts of money to fix the problems that it was created. It was creating, and that's unusual in the CAFO industry because most of their harm is externalized and is paid for by the taxpayers. The toxic wastewater had seeped into the cow pens also, and the walkways. So you ask yourself, what did this do for the cows? Well, they got some better conditions, nothing, nothing close to what they should have gotten, but thoughtful negotiation by the environmental attorneys improved their living conditions. The Cow Palace agreed to install concrete and piping 
to divert the wastewater from where the cows lived and walked and, and were and into the lagoons. So the cows got cleaner, drier areas to stand in and lie in and walk. North Carolina is one of many states that has CAFOs. In fact, North Carolina has 6,500 pig and chicken CAFOs. There are more pigs in North Carolina than there are human beings. And those pigs produced 10 billion gallons of feces and urine every year. This slide shows where the hog CAFOs are in North Carolina. And by the way, North Carolina is just one of many states where there are CAFOs, but it is an interesting example because Smithfield Company and its subsidiary, Murphy Brown, intentionally built most of those CAFOs in the eastern part of the state. That's where low-income people of color live and have for generations. Many of them have owned property in this area since the Civil War, some since colonial times. CAFOs moved into their neighborhood, and not just in the general community, but right across the street. What does that mean for these residents? It means odor pollution, which even at low concentrations can cause gastrointestinal, stress-related and respiratory symptoms and may negatively impact their brains and their organs. It means that the local economy suffers rather than improves and small-scale farming is pushed out. It means noise pollution from the trucks that are delivering and picking up pigs all day and all night. It means that the value of their homes is half of what it was before the CAFOs entered. And it means increased illness rates, which have been observed to people who live near CAFOs. These residents appealed to their local elected officials and to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. They did that repeatedly and they got no response. So 500 of these residents gathered together and they sued in 26 separate lawsuits and juries agreed with them that they were being harmed. They sued for nuisance, common state law nuisance. In one of those cases, McIver versus Murphy Brown, the jury returned a verdict in favor of these plaintiff neighbors, awarding 75,000 in compensatory damages per plaintiff and a total of $5 million in punitive damages, which was later reduced to $2.5 million to comply with a statutory cap on punitive damages that exists in North Carolina. On appeal, it went to the Fourth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit affirmed the jury verdict. Smithfield was asking for a complete retrial and the, the court said no. They affirmed the jury verdict to, as to liability for compensatory and, computed, and punitive damages, but remanded the case solely on the issue of the amount of punitive damages. These 26 nuisance lawsuits achieved an astounding litigation victory and really showed Smithfield for what it is. Smithfield is willing to harm low-income residents, people of black and brown color in its constant pursuit of profit. Sadly, the North Carolina legislature is way too friendly with big ag and it amended its right to farm law to severely limit any future nuisance lawsuits. So going back, if I can, I'm playing around here with these. Going back to my fabulous graphic, look for the opportunities, okay? Challenges can be opportunities. We can educate the public and prove that the CAFO industry is causing all of these harms and others, that they treat the animals miserably, that they treat the workers terribly, that they knowingly harm the people and the communities who are forced to live next to them, and that this is an evil, unsustainable system that makes a few corporations very rich at the expense of everyone else, especially the animals. And we can partner with our colleagues in other movements to bring the CAFO system down. So I wanna urge you to think outside the box, work with colleagues in other movements, build a bigger tent, attack from all angles, and let's bury this industry. but I'm not finished, you're not rid of me yet. Um, I have a couple of shout outs. One is for undercover investigations, which have been conducted by a number of groups very successfully and have produced important evidence showing the terrible treatment of the animals in the CAFO system and in slaughterhouses. Recently, 
as many of you have heard, two activists who entered into a CAFO in Utah and exited with two sick piglets were charged with felony burglary and theft. They were tried and they were acquitted. Yeah. So you may be wondering how did they get off? Um, there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, the felony burglary charge was for entering the building with intent to remove piglets from a gestation crate building. Now, as we all know, gestation crates house pregnant pigs. There are no piglets because they haven't been born yet. The piglets don't come until the, the sow has been transferred to a farrowing crate. In arguing about the difference between gestation and farrowing crates, the defense was able to prove that defendants went in there to film cruelty, not to, not to find piglets, and um, they had zero intent to remove the piglets from the gestation crates because there were no piglets in the gestation crates. Not only was the judge forced to drop the charge at the end of the trial, but this little snafu undermined the credibility of the prosecution, which should have, somebody should have told them about the difference. Also, they presented expert veterinary testimony and relied on that, but it came from an equine veterinarian. And apparently the prosecution didn't seem to notice that horses are different from pigs. Uh, finally, rather than focusing on systemic abuse rampant in CAFOs, the defense focused on the suffering of two little baby pigs. They were sick, they were dying, they were on the floor of the CAFO, and they would have been tossed into the garbage. They were of no value to the CAFO. So acquittal, acquittal, interesting. But the question we should ponder is, is our society starting to change its attitude towards animals raised for food? Yeah. I hope, I hope so. And finally, we at CALS have some exciting news. Now, unlike most law students, this turkey bell is not afraid to tell me what she thinks of me. And she didn't like me. Uh, but we have some exciting news, Bell and me. The Center for Animal Law Studies is in the process of launching the world's first animal law, SJD. Now, yeah, yeah. For those who may not be familiar with an SJD, it is a doctor of juridical science. It's the academic equivalent of a PhD in law. Our faculty at Lewis and Clark unanimously approved our proposal. The board of trustees passed a resolution stating that Lewis and Clark Law School is quote, ideally situated to offer an exceptional SJD in animal law by leveraging its current programming. The CALS SJD will cultivate thought leadership in the field of animal law as we continue to facilitate innovative ways to advance legal protections for all animals. Now I'm done. Thanks for listening. Hi. I'm Piper Hoffman. I am the Senior Director of Legal Advocacy at Animal Outlook. And uh, thank you all for being here and for your interest in the challenges and opportunities that lawyers have in advocating for farmed animals. And to start off, I have to say what a privilege it is to share this stage with two powerhouses of the animal advocacy movement. And uh, Joyce in particular uh, has got my career launched. I don't know that I would be here without her. She is um, affectionately known as the mother of animal law. She basically invented it. Joyce founded the Animal Legal Defense Fund. <laughs> So I work at Animal Outlook, which is a nationwide nonprofit. We advocate for farmed animals and we work towards the abolition of the animal agriculture industry. 
And along the way, we make all the vegans we can. We have four programs, undercover investigations, farm transitions, outreach, and legal advocacy, which is where I work. Oh, I have slides. So this slide gives you a sort of bird's eye view of a part of our legal strategy. And that top circle is seeking criminal enforcement of anti-cruelty laws, which is something that we do after each investigation. The next is strategic litigation and policy work. Although we, we don't do a lot of policy work ourselves, we're a 501c3, but our strategic litigation involves a number of different types of laws and um, a lot of creativity and uh, taking a chance, seeing what happens. The third circle, growing the fields. I teach animal law at NYU Law School. Our executive director, Cheryl Leahy, has a law review article coming out very soon. We have three classes of legal interns each year, spring, summer, and fall. And we work to develop litigation theories and to, to prove them that the private bar might be interested in picking up. So that way we can have people who aren't even necessarily animal advocates, but who see that this is the kind of case that can succeed. And as a result, we have multiplied our impact. I mentioned that one of our programs is undercover investigations. There we go. Most of you are probably familiar with a lot of the value of undercover investigations. They offer a counterpoint to the ubiquitous industry speech about how wonderful animal agriculture is. They are the only way for us to find out what is actually going on in these animal agriculture facilities. They shine a public light. Leah may have used exactly those words. <laughs> <laughs> on systemic harms to animals. And uh, they're very handy at making people vegan. Undercover investigations also have unique value for litigators because they are evidence. They are fantastic evidence. So we can use those for that top circle of seeking criminal enforcement after litigation. And uh, I'll give an example of that later on with Martin Farms. They are also important to that second circle of strategic, usually civil litigation. Uh, and we have an example of that. Yeah, we have some examples there. Circle to strategic civil litigation. A lot of our efforts in this area fall into a category that we roughly call unfair business practices. The idea is that we take civil laws that are not meant to protect animals and we use them to protect animals. So one example, Cal Cruz hatcheries. We did an investigation, prosecutor declined to enforce the anti-cruelty law so with uh, representation from the Animal Legal Defense Fund, we sued them for unfair competition. Six days later, Whole Foods cut its ties with Cal Cruz hatcheries. And in the end, we obtained a court order closing Cal Cruz hatcheries for good. Yeah and also requiring the defendants to pay our attorney's fees. So that is key, not just because ALDF uses the money very well, but also because that is the kind of case that the private bar will pick up. If they see that they can get their attorney's fees, they will go out and find other defendants and bring the same kinds of cases. 
So a current example of this at Animal Outlook, we have sued the American Heart Association. You may have heard of them. Uh, they're big and old and they are very trusted on the subject of heart health. So they've got this heart check symbol, which lower right corner, which they put on packages of meat that then say certified heart healthy. This is despite the fact that AHA sponsors all kinds of scientific studies and journals that report those studies that often come to the conclusion that eating meat is bad for your heart and more meat is more bad, yet they put this symbol on meat. So AHA recognizes that consumers based on that symbol will buy meat, possibly when they might not have bought it otherwise because of concerns about cardiac health. And what AHA never tells them, the companies that get that symbol paid for it. They bought that symbol from AHA. So uh, I sued them a little bit. Uh, <laughs> And we currently have um, a motion to dismiss pending in court. So we will see where that goes. And that is another example of a litigation theory that, that private attorneys may pick up and run with. So back to seeking criminal enforcement. Ideally, we do an investigation. We give the evidence to law enforcement and law enforcement enforces the law. Yeah. Unfortunately, that usually does not happen. Um, and the obstacles that we face include an idea that's pervasive in the, in the legal profession that um, farmed animals are not protected from cruelty. There are 37 states whose anti-cruelty laws include an exemption for routine husbandry practices or some different wording that essentially means if this is the way that animal products are produced, it's not cruel. So, and, and sadly, um, we found that, that prosecutors and even some judges have absorbed the idea that that means that farmed animals have no protection at all. Animal Outlook conducted an undercover investigation of Martin Farms in Pennsylvania, a dairy production facility, and found egregious cruelty, asked for enforcement, and they didn't even say no, they said nothing. So then we got some media and then they responded, but they still said, no, we're not going to enforce the law. So Pennsylvania has this very cool procedure where a private party can essentially take a prosecutor to court for failing to enforce the law. We did that. And the uh, trial judge um, <clears throat> didn't agree with us. He pretty much took all of the evidence and expert testimony from the prosecutor and the police and ignored our investigation video and our expert witness. So we appealed and the appellate court produced this beautiful opinion, I think 26 pages long, saying essentially that the anti-cruelty laws do protect farmed animals and noting that at Martin Farms, their handling of downed cows was not according to normal husbandry practices, their excessive shocking and tail pulling and their disbudding of calves with no pain relief were not standard practices and were subject to criminal liability. Uh, the uh, instigator of this, this particular case, Will Lowry is here right now and I'm gonna embarrass the crap out of him. Stand up, Will. <laughs> So that appellate opinion in Pennsylvania is useful for everyone in every state because obviously it's not binding precedent, 
But we can go to other states and say, look, Pennsylvania's anti-cruelty law looks a whole lot like yours, and they recognize that it applies to cows. So you can too. Uh, one more current example uh, of, of how we seek criminal enforcement and generally leverage investigations for legal advocacy. We did an undercover investigation at Cook Aquaculture in Maine. It was the first investigation of a fish hatchery in the United States. We found egregious cruelty and we asked for law enforcement. And what we got instead was um, a statement in writing that there is no entity in the state of Maine responsible for applying the anti-cruelty law to fish. I think this is emblematic of a probably global, but certainly nationwide failure to recognize the experiences of aquatic animals. So we filed a rulemaking petition in Maine, which has a rule that if 150 registered Maine voters sign a petition to an agency asking it to initiate rulemaking, it has to initiate rulemaking. We suggested that perhaps they should initiate rulemaking that would allow them to uh, protect fish via the anti-cruelty law, which by its terms certainly applies to fish. Um, the agency denied the petition. So I, I'm not entirely clear that they're even allowed to do that, uh, but we are currently exploring our next steps. So stay tuned for the application of the anti-cruelty law to fish in Maine. And uh, finally, Animal Outlook's Farm Transitions Program, uh, similar to Transformations, we work to support farmers who are transitioning from animals to growing plants. And our secret weapon is TJ Bradford. He is a fifth generation farmer. He has a PhD in agronomics. He was a professor of agronomics and generally the man knows how to grow plants. So he uh, is able to give both technical support and business uh, consultation about how to, how to build a business growing plants. Um, he is just generally fantastic. And with that, I'm going to say thank you. I look forward to your questions, and I appreciate all the work that all of you are doing as well. Thanks. Done? No, I think we're okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those wonderful presentations. And we're now going to turn to questions from the audience. If you have a question, go up to one of the mics, please, so that everybody can hear you. Um, those who are joining us virtually, you can submit questions via, via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And it's hard to see back there. Hello, hi. We do have a virtual question. For You're those of to us shout looking out to work. I can't see you. Okay, do you want to start, Megan? <laughs> for oh. those of us looking to work at places like Mercy for Animals and Animal Outlook, but have no background in animal law or work, how would you suggest we approach the organizations? What is something that you would look for in a candidate that can outshine this lack of experience? At Animal Outlook, uh, we are interested in lawyers who can be creative, who can see the big picture, remain strategic, and also think outside the box. Um, I I'm not convinced that experience in animal law specifically is a prerequisite for any of that. And in fact, experience in other areas of law can help an attorney to see opportunities in those areas of law that we hadn't thought of before. So what I'm particularly interested in is how a person's brain works. Are they able to look at a problem, think strategically, be creative, 
find a proposed solution and then evaluate its strength. And I also look for a long-term commitment to animal advocacy. Is, can you repeat the question? Is it from a lawyer, like somebody in the law field or somebody outside of the law field? Outside of the law field. So somebody who's not a lawyer, who's not looking to be a lawyer, but wants to get in. Correct. We have a million jobs. Like, just look at our website. Um, we have, there are a lot of other jobs besides, I mean, the law, we have 12 team members that are in, in law and, and work in all kinds of legal sides of our organization, but we have finance people, we have HR people, we have operational folks, um, then we have the campaigners, we have the programs people, we have comms people, we have social media people, like all of these ways that you can help animals. Um, and if you're just getting started, I would say be a volunteer and start coming to our volunteer events to get a feel for what is where your interest is. And I always tell people, if you're in my student talk yesterday, I said, find the intersection of what you're good at and what you love. And that's where you need to follow. And then you'll be sure to be able to last. When I kind of two things that I look for in an interview, um, one of them is, well, one of the most important things is optimism. So if I, one of the questions now, I'm just giving it away, but whatever, I'm gonna tell you what this, I'll say like, wh where do you see the animal field in 10 years? And if someone is it's just really, if, if they're like, we're just gonna keep trying, it's gonna be like, we're, it's gonna be hard, there's gonna be progress, but we're, we're gonna make that progress. Or someone's like, I don't, like people are never gonna stop eating meat. It's just, blah, 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 you know, that's not a good answer. <laughs> that's, I also ask people for grit. Grit and optimism are two things that I you can show, um, and you re, you need optimism and grit to work in this field. So another question I might ask would be something like, "You've done this campaign, you've worked with this legislative change, it failed. How do you address the team? How do you what do you do next?" And how people answer that question tells me how much grit they have. If they're like, you know, I need to take time off. I'm like, sad, you know, I'm sad and like that all this. I I don't know how I'm going to go on that sort. Of, but instead, if you're saying things like we're going to analyze where we failed, where we went wrong. We're going to get back out there. We're going to keep going. Like the grit, grit is really important. Um, grit and optimism. Yeah. Thank you. That was a good question. Now I can't ask them anymore in interviews. So <laughs> think of something else now. Okay, we'll start over here. Hi, Anin. Uh, my name is Patience Johnston. I'm an Indigenous student, uh, Indigenous student and Indigenous studies student at Georgian College in Barrie, Ontario, Canada. I'm here with Student Sovereignty. I'm part of their cohort. And um, as I'm listening to presentations, I'm really honored to be in this room. I think that it's providing a lot of guidance and support for something that is really deeply sacred to me. And as an Indigenous person of Canada, I think that there's a lot of things that occur naturally and that have occurred for centuries um, pre-contact that uh, occur in, in practices such as veganism or in, especially in animal law. And so it's it's more of a question, I guess, like for any of the oh, sorry, the microphone. Any person in the room really is um when when I hear about organizations starting from from something like the work that that you've done, um, I wonder what indigenous perspectives we're incorporating and if there's any support for indigenous people during this process, if if we're considering teachings that Indigenous people have known to cure environmental crises, if there is any sustainability processes or projects that incorporate Indigenous communities within the areas, if there's any even representatives or officers, any social workers that are on your teams that can reach out to these communities that aren't. I learned the word intertribal today. That's not something that exists in Canada. Um, if, if, if we are on native land always, then what are we doing within the scope of all of our practices and our studies to incorporate otherwise erased history and, and notions of everything that is in agreement with what we're all here today to kind of celebrate and also present the challenges. Like you said, that where there are challenges there are opportunities and attacking from all angles, I think, relies upon indigenous perspectives. So I just I just care to wonder um what 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 is what is being done. It it, it occurred to me during the, the the first presentation when they were talking about um who is in charge of who is eligible to have their their voice heard. And I'm hearing PhD, I'm hearing 
there are plenty of jobs you, in HR and in this and in that, but students don't want to go to school. Indigenous students don't have schools. Indigenous people have it embedded in their systems to not want to be within the system. And so how do we, how do we incorporate and, and understand that within, within this scope? And if, I wonder if you guys have considered that um, in a less challenging and abrupt way and a more welcoming and, and um, genuine curiosity. <laughs> it's a, I'm, I'm really sure it's a really large question to I ask. Yeah, I yeah, kind of lost there's a lot, track. There's a lot to unpack. I'd love to talk to you afterwards <laughs> yeah. as well. But I, I want to commend you for bringing this question to us. We should all be made to feel uncomfortable by that question and embrace the discomfort. No, in a good way. Like I embrace, I embrace discomfort. I embrace our um, w the blind spots we have in our work. And it's a blind spot for animal advocacy. Um, I will say that our SVP of culture that we have at our organization is more than 50% indigenous, has raised these issues. And I think that it's, it's not just, I mean, in, we're missing the indigenous voice for sure in this work and thinking through that. Uh, and we're missing so many voices. If for too long, if anybody was at my animal rights conference um, and I gave a whole talk on this, so it's too much for this. Uh, for too long, the work that we have done in this animal movement has been largely uh, people of high income, white privileged. So that has been the dominant voice, the dominant life experience that's come to solve problems. And we need to really open the scope because animal cruelty, the cruelty caused to farmed animals in particular is caused by every, every type of person is involved in this. So we need every type of person uh, helping to solve the problem. So, you know, I think you've got a really important voice, uh, voice and an important point that you're making. I love your, your thought about um, not coming at it from a, like the systemic educational perspective. Uh, you will come up with solutions that no one else has. Uh, Mercy for Animals has something called the People's Fund and the People's Fund is where we are funding different voices, doing different kinds of work. Um, from all kind, and, and it's majority people of color who are doing this kind of work because we recognize that we are predominantly um, a white privileged perspective and we want to figure out how to have other voices and expand resources to those other voices so we can have more diverse solutions. So maybe you'll apply to the People's Fund and figure out how you can be, you know, having your solutions raised and brought into the forefront. So thank you for that. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hi, uh, my name is Lindsay. I'm a, a law student at Chapman University. Um, many people, uh, especially those who benefit from the status quo of factory farming are not willing to engage with animal advocates in good faith. How do you respond when you are met with indifference or hostility? In the context of legal advocacy, um, there are a couple of different ways to respond and it depends partly on what strategies and what objectives you have decided to focus on. If you are already working on litigation, you can expect hostility. That's what you're going to get. Um, if you want to work on more collaborative types of approaches such as getting companies to uh, assign commitments to increase animal welfare or to get on board supporting a legislative proposal um, that, that requires more of a back and forth relationship with the producers. The most important thing I think is that when you do encounter that kind of opposition and hostility that you do not back down because we are the voice for the animals and if we, if we silence ourselves, the animals no longer have a voice. So my, my one priority in those situations is to stick to my position. <laughs> I have a book called Turning Adversaries into Allies to Change the Chicken Industry, Grills. Um, and I have a TED talk on that. So I recommend if you're looking for strategies about when you're sitting down with the so-called enemy, how you can um, figure out common 
places to start with. The basic is start with what you have in common rather than starting with the things that you don't have in common. And as a person talking to another human being, you can always find something in common. And that could be as small as the football team you like, or they have a dog, you love dogs, everybody loves dogs, those sorts of things. Um, and build from there and try to try to build a, a common common ground before you go straight to the point of disagreement. But um, I'd be happy to share any more strategies afterwards if anybody's interested. Thank you. Do we have anyone else? Sorry, it's hard to hear. Hello. Okay. What are your thoughts on cultivated yeah, meat? Online? What are your thoughts on cultivated meat and the potential for changes for farmed animals? Um, so the animal advocacy movement includes a lot of strategies, a lot of different philosophies and different approaches. And I am really glad because it's going to take everybody's idea. It's going to take everybody's approaches to tackle what we're facing. Um, for cultivated meat, it's, it's, a, um, it's a market response to the question of how. How are we going to move away from eating animals? And one possibility is these new products. I like to think that our legal advocacy provides the public with the answer to the question, why? Why should you move away from eating animals? Why should you try these new products? Because of what is actually happening to animals every single day, which we, um, which we document and provide to the media and to the courts. Uh, I had the fantastic opportunity to try cultivated chicken about a month ago. I flew to Singapore for um, a conference with farmed animal advocates and I was invited by Good Meat, which is um, the subsidiary of Just Egg. And they Singapore is the only country in the world that has approved the sale of cultivated meat for consumption. And we were treated to the opportunity. It was the first time I had eaten chicken in over 20 years. And for me, you know, it was a, it was a, a very emotional life-changing moment for me in the sense that I understood it wasn't like chicken, it was chicken. It was not, it was, it was chicken. I mean, I had a hard time eating it. I'll be honest. It's not for me. It's not for anybody who's vegan. It's for people who are going to be stubborn and eat meat forever. And great that we have that solution because a lot of like more animals are being killed every single year. We need all the solutions. I regularly say we need to throw all the spaghetti at the wall. There's not one noodle <laughs> that's going to be the solution. And cultivated meat is a really important solution that we should all get behind, in my opinion, because it is an important solution that those who are going to just refuse to go vegan or continue to want to eat animals, this is a solution for them. Uh, and there will be a lot of people who's, who are like that for the, for the foreseeable future. I think we have to remember that this, is, this method, this, this CAFO method, is not an age-old, I mean, it's not age-old wisdom. It doesn't go back generations. It started pretty much after World War II. And it's an experiment that is failing. Yes, it's getting bigger. I know it, it, it seems as if, oh my God, it's just going to get bigger and bigger, but it's not sustainable. If those companies have to internalize all of the costs that they externalize because of subsidies and taxpayer support, they can't survive. And it, it's, it's simply got to go away at some point. And our job is to make that point as soon as possible. Okay. Um, We've got more questions there and then we we'll start. Uh, hi, my name is Morgan. I'm a student at UCLA Law School. And I was wondering, uh, since both of your organizations do undercover investigation work and also have these um, transformation farm transition programs, um, I was wondering, and I think both are so important, um, but I was wondering if your investigatory work um, or the reputation of your uh, organizations as um, animal rights organizations ever um, poses challenges for forming trusting relationships 
with farmers in your transition programs? Good question. Oh, good yeah. question. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> it's like you've been sitting in our boardrooms or something. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. It has been an important um, way that we we talk about undercover investigations in as we go forward. So a very real shift that Mercy for Animals has embraced in recent years since I took over in 2018, we do not prosecute workers. Um, we do we believe in systemic change and and holding companies accountable yeah. rather um, than going after the farmers or the individual workers. And there's a lot to unpack there, I know, and it's not an absolute, but that is generally how we've approached it. So this is when we go to visit with farmers, we have a common enemy because let's say there's a chicken factory farmer who is under the contract of Pilgrims or Tyson that's who we're holding accountable in our undercover investigations too. That's who we're blaming with the transitions too. That's who we're finding a common enemy with when the contract grower is saying, I'm half a million dollars of debt. I hate this job. I can't get out or I lose everything five generations worth of being on this land. So it has absolutely shifted and we have shifted away. And previously we did prosecute workers. And a lot of times that really was allowed the companies to have a, a scapegoat essentially so fire you know fire the worker and they carry on with their practices so we've gone for more systemic institutional accountability um and that has helped us when we go to farmers to say to to not have recent examples where we've held that farmer you know feet to the fire or had that farmer in the media had that farmer shamed instead of the company and and that gets the bigger change too that's what we want the bigger institutional change so good good question then Thank you. So I was also very excited to hear about the farm transition programs, um, especially hearing that you meet with farmers who don't want to be in the industry. It reminded me of something Renee from Rowdy Girl Sanctuaries shared recently that every chicken farmer she's ever met wanted to get out. I had my own experience with that recently. Uh, I work on a ballot initiative in Oregon to criminalize killing animals statewide, including slaughter, hunting, um, experimentation. And I met a pig farmer who signed our petition a few weeks ago and said, I'm signing my name so that I'll be forced to stop killing my own pigs. And that was a really powerful moment for me. And so my question is, how might organizations that have these farm transition programs partner and cooperate or capitalize on ballot initiatives, not just like in Oregon, but the initiative that DXE is putting forward for a factory farming moratorium or the factory farming ban that was put forward in Switzerland? How might those movements urge people to transition before they're even passed? I mean, is there a partnership there, do you think? There absolutely is a potential partnership. Um, I think it's, I agree with you that, that these farmers, for the most part, we're talking about, for example, in the poultry industry, we're talking about um, individuals who have some land and, and often some agricultural background um, and they contract with one of the mega corporations like Tyson or Purdue. Uh, and they'll, all they do is uh, for six weeks from the time that a chicken is a chick until six weeks later when they're slaughtered, because that's how long chickens live who are, who are raised for meat. Um, this farmer is responsible for them for those six weeks. and. The contract terms between that farmer and the larger companies are not at all favorable to the farmers because this industry, the animal agriculture industry, is able to be profitable only by externalizing a dizzying array of costs, often onto taxpayers. There, there's so many subsidies that the government provides um and price supports and just a whole a, a large number of ways the taxpayer money is used to prop up the industry they externalize costs by polluting the environment and not cleaning it up they externalize costs by making the lives of their neighbors hell and making their property worthless and not paying for any of that either and also 
by uh, externalizing the cost of labor by underpaying people and exploiting labor. And we absolutely have a common cause right there that these mega corporations are exploiting all of us. They are forcing all of us to pay to keep them profitable. And part of our strategy has to be kicking those supports out from under them so that the industry cannot make a profit. We have time for one more question before our break. Thank you. I would like to ask you a question about fundraising, which I assume that you have robust fundraising platforms supporting your programs. I'd like to know about what percentage of your time individually is inter uh, intersects with your fundraising activities. Do, and do you find that traditional modes of fundraising like um, corporate and foundational uh, support and individual major donors versus uh, acquiring new members at lower giving levels? Do you find any particular fundraising approach more efficacious in, in your work? And do you put a particular emphasis on major donors uh, in your in your work? Um, is there an aspect of what we're discussing today that lends itself more towards individuals with uh, greater wealth versus the general population that may not have as much money, but you're recruiting to the cause through uh, general uh, information that's being made available through your campaigns and that sort of thing. So I'd like to know about your your approach to fundraising. Has is it changing? Does it does it give you adequate? So do you feel you have adequate uh, fundraising support for the activities that you are engaged in? Um, you know, none of us started out as fundraisers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as it the head of legal advocacy, um, over the past two years, I've spent a total of two hours talking to potential funders. Um, so unfortunately, I just do, I, I am not qualified to answer the question. Any nonprofit agency um, has to develop robust fundraising and it has to, people talk about the buckets. You have to have all your buckets lined up, the major donors, the corporations, the grant making, the estates. Uh, I think any, any nonprofit today is looking to all of those buckets and, and the buckets differ somewhat. Some, some groups rely more on the states. Um, for me, major donors are the most fun because it's people to people and I enjoy getting to know people and them getting to know me. Um, that's It's always been that way for me. Um, the movement has changed so much. I mean, when I think back to 30 years ago when we were starting you know, getting off the ground with ALDF, we couldn't get grants. No grants were going to animal agencies, it simply didn't exist. So that's changed a great deal. And now there's animal grant makers and there are people giving specifically to animal groups, which is exciting. The, the field is growing, the funding base is growing. Um, and each of us learns what works best for our organization. Uh, if I'm not being specific enough, but it varies. I'll just say there's never enough money for farmed animals. So if you happen to be a major donor, let's talk afterwards. <laughs> That's why you're asking. Um, <laughs> we, is, there, is there enough money to do what you need to do? No, there's not. There's nowhere near. I mean, nowhere near. There's, you know, there's Animal Outlook. There's, there's like six six big organizations, let's say, bigger working on farmed animals globally, like in a in working in this big, maybe, maybe 10, let's say. And I would say together, they don't have more than 100, $150 million, let's say, all of them together globally, including Europe. We're talking about an industry that has hundreds of billions of dollars that are we're trying to fight. And we're in Asia, there's 80% of farmed animals. There's, we are nowhere close to having enough money. We've always been scrappy and made it work. But we have to have a breakthrough. We really need a breakthrough in terms of the amount of money that is coming to farmed animals for us to have that you know, impact that we need to have to really stop factory farming. And I actively work with, I mean, I spend two hours a day, so like <laughs> not two hours in my lifetime. No, I, our major donors, our donors at every single level are our partners in this work. We 
how, you know, I think some of the most substantial thing you do is taking money out of your wallet is to give to a cause is just so significant and meaningful, believing in, in the work that we're doing. And I really value, I love major donors too, but I also love the people that are giving $5, you know, I love them all. Like <laughs> we can't do this work, but I think that we're going to have to have some big breakthrough um, moments for us to have the kind of impact that we need to have. Uh, and, you know, think about the environmental industry, not industry, the nonprofit um, sector. Uh, I think the stat is something like um, of the environmental animal um, philanthropy in the United States, only 2% of that goes to animals and a less than, it's like 0.02% goes to farmed animals of the amount that goes to animals of the 2% that it's, it's a, like the graph is all wrong on how much money goes to farmed animals. And think about what we could do if we had these sort of transformational breakthroughs. And I don't, sometimes I get so, you can hear my voice, I get so frustrated. We were in the New York Times by Ezra, Ezra Klein listed this as something um, in the New York Times that it was on the New York Times um, gift list, you know, for their charity gift list. And it was saying farmed animals, like we're going to look back and forward in future generations. And it listed Mercy for Animals, the Humane League, and GFI as three groups. And I remember my husband going like, what's going on? Like, how could you have the New York Times naming you all and you don't have breakthrough grants? You don't have these breakthrough moments. So we, it's definitely a problem we need to solve. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm told we can have one more question. Hi, my name is Jennifer. Thank you for all the work that you do. Leia, I was at your gala this year in Los Angeles. And can you please tell, tell everyone the story that you guys told about the, the mother cow? Oh. <laughs> you know which one I mean, right? Yeah, Norma. How she fought for her and, and her, her baby. I think everyone needs to hear it. It's so powerful. Okay. Um, we have a couple, two minutes. Sure. Okay. Do. All right. <laughs> um, Okay, so this this is the story of Norma, um, and I am writing a new book, and there's going to be a whole chapter about Norma, so because it's such a meaningful story. So Norma is a dairy cow um, who has been abused by the dairy industry, and she had been in a farm in Vermont and had gone through nine, preg I'm going to go into more, a little more details, but nine pregnancies, nine times that uh, her babies had been taken from her right. over and over and over again. And on the, on the 10th time, she, she couldn't take it anymore. And she attacked the worker who was coming to take. So her baby, her baby was born. Her baby's name is Nina. Her baby was born and she was doing all the things that mothers do, um, loving, loving, licking, cuddling and along comes this worker to break their bond and she said absolutely not no more and she fought like fought like hell she attacked and um, harmed this worker to the extent that he was sent to the hospital wow. and the result was that she was condemned to death for this action and what happened next is not something that you would expect but the very person who was sent to hospital was the one who begged for her mercy mm -hmm. And he said she was only doing something that any mother would do. Mm -hmm. And please don't kill her for that simple act that we all can relate to. And he worked with his girlfriend to find a sanctuary for her to go to. And that was Vine Sanctuary in Vermont. And not, so I actually went to visit Vermont Vine Sanctuary very recently, um, about three weeks ago. And I didn't know this at the time, but when I told this story, but the farm sanctuary manager, Cheryl there, also managed to get the daughter of Nina, Nina to come to the sanctuary too. And I went to the sanctuary and we looked all around the sanctuary. And finally we found Norma and Nina sitting on a hill together, free mm -hmm. and living out their days finally together. So that is the story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this has been a marvelous panel. Thank you both.